Have you ever watched the waves crash on the beach and wondered to yourself, how deep are the briny depths? What's the absolute deepest point in the ocean? Let's find out on today's episode of Colossal Question. Throughout history, if you wanted to measure just how deep a body of water was, you had to tie a weight to a rope and let it drop to the bottom. Then measure how much rope went in the water. Not too hard. But when it comes to the ocean, it would take thousands of feet of rope to measure some of the deeper parts. So for centuries, no one really knew just how deep our oceans are. That is, until the late 1800s, when a British Navy ship named the HMS Challenger set out on a voyage to learn more about the briny deep. The ship was outfitted with over 900,000 feet of hemp rope, more than enough to reach even the deepest, darkest places. During the four-year journey, the crew of the Challenger managed to find the bottom of the ocean, the Mariana Trench. This massive crack in the Pacific Ocean stretches for more than 1,500 miles. Even still, the HMS Challenger found what is maybe the single deepest point, now known as the Challenger Deep on the southern end of the Mariana Trench. Nowadays, experts use high-tech, state-of-the-art sonar technology to precisely map the ocean floor, giving us a much clearer picture of what the trench looks like and exactly how far down the Challenger Deep really goes. 35,856 feet. That's close to seven miles. That's deep. Really, really deep. How deep exactly? Well, the diving limit for recreational scuba divers is 130 feet. That's about the height of a large building. Pretty deep. Blue whales, the biggest known creatures to ever live on Earth, can dive down to more than 1,500 feet, double that depth to 3,000 feet, and sunlight can no longer penetrate the water. The wreck of the Titanic sits on the cold ocean floor, about 12,000 feet underwater. And on average, the Earth's oceans are about 14,000 feet deep. To put those depths into perspective, the tallest skyscraper in New York City is a mere 1,776 feet tall. The absolute deepest shipwreck ever uncovered sits at the bottom of the Philippine Sea, 21,180 feet down. The Atlantic Ocean goes even deeper than that, maxing out at 27,500 feet. For comparison, Mount Everest, the highest place on Earth, is 29,032 feet, just a few thousand feet taller than the Atlantic Ocean is deep. Whoa! But even the mighty Everest can't come close to competing with the Pacific Ocean's Mariana Trench. The Challenger Deep, the deepest known point in the entire ocean, is an amazing 35,856 feet below the waves. Because no light can penetrate that deep, and because the pressure of the water above is so insanely immense, only highly specialized submersibles are able to venture down into Challenger Deep and explore. Down there are some of the most fascinating, strange, and in some cases horrifying creatures on the planet. And the more we explore, the more we find. Then who knows what they'll find next? About 71% of the Earth's surface is covered with water, and about two in five people on Earth live within 60 miles of an ocean. So clearly, we love the water. But have you ever stopped and wondered what would happen if the oceans disappeared? Let's find out on today's episode of Colossal Question. The Earth has five oceans, the Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, Southern, and Arctic. All together, they're known as the world's ocean. All that water plays a pivotal role in Earth's ability to sustain life. So if it was all to dry up, we'd really be in some trouble. You see, our oceans move radiation that comes from the sun all around the planet. 
They take in the sun's warmth and energy, then move it around in currents of water that cycle warm towards the poles and cold water towards the equator. This transfer is the key to keeping our planet from getting too hot or too cold. Without oceans, the sun's rays would cook the equator and leave the poles so cold, nothing could survive there. The Earth's oceans are also important for the water cycle. As you probably know, H2O evaporates from oceans, lakes, or any body of water into the air where it forms clouds that eventually drop back down in the form of rainfall. Without those clouds forming, rain would be rare and Earth would quickly become a desert almost everywhere. Animals and most plants would dry out and die fairly quickly without oceans and rain. All that dead plant life combined with dry, rising temperatures would cause massive fires that would stretch for thousands of miles. All those extreme flames would release tons of carbon dioxide into the air, slowly choking out the atmosphere and heating up the planet even more to temperatures over 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So, as you can see, life without our oceans would be pretty grisly. But there is one piece of good news. Experts estimate that at the earliest, the oceans would take several hundred million years to evaporate, and it would take close to a billion years for Earth to dry up completely. So don't worry, the oceans aren't going anywhere. Let's just not take them for granted. Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. But why? Have you ever stopped and wondered why all the oceans are salty? Let's find out on today's episode of Colossal Questions. There are five oceans on our planet. The Pacific Ocean is the biggest, then the Atlantic, Indian, Southern, and Arctic Oceans. Some oceans are saltier than others, but usually around 3.5% of ocean water is salt. You see, the sea floor has huge amounts of minerals that are constantly being swished, swirled, and stirred up by the natural motion of the ocean. This causes tiny amounts of minerals, called salts, to break away from the sea floor and dissolve into the ocean water, making it salty. Lakes, streams, and rivers, on the other hand, aren't salty at all. But why? Why is it just the ocean? Well, it turns out that lakes, streams, and rivers do actually have small amounts of dissolved salt in them, too. It's just a much smaller amount than in the ocean. Salty minerals have a hard time building up in lakes because lakes tend to have rivers and streams that carry away the minerals quickly. The lake can't dissolve as much salt as the streams and rivers can carry away. And guess where all the streams and rivers carry that salty mineral water? To the ocean! So, not only does the ocean do a good job of making its own salt water, it also takes in all the salts and minerals from lakes, streams, and rivers around the world. But some lakes don't have rivers and streams to take the salt away. When that happens, you end up with the Dead Sea or the Great Salt Lake. Since they have no outlets, the salt slowly builds up in the water with nowhere to go, making the water way more salty than the ocean. The Great Salt Lake can get up to 27% salt, and the Dead Sea can be close to 34%. Remember, the oceans are only 3.5% salt. That's about 10 times saltier than the ocean, which means no aquatic life can survive there except for bacteria. So, whether it's the saltiest lake on Earth or a fresh babbling brook, there's always some salt in the water. Have you ever been playing in the sand on a sunny day at the beach and wondered, where did all this sand come from in the first place? Let's find out on today's episode of Colossal Question. Sand is made from a natural process called erosion, which is when something is slowly worn away by some sort of natural force, like wind, water, or just the wear and tear of animal traffic. Sand is made when rocks are slowly whittled down into tiny little pebble grains. The long, slow process starts all the way up high in the mountains. 
That's where alpine winds and water first get to work, breaking down massive mountains, tiny little piece by tiny little piece over thousands of years. As rocks chip off mountains or break away into rivers, they make their way slowly downstream, eroding and breaking down into even smaller pieces as the water swirls the rocks around. Eventually, all rivers lead to the ocean, and so do most of our mountain rock particles traveling downstream. As they go, waves, tides, and other stuff in the water keep breaking down those pieces until they become those tiny little rock grains we call sand. Most of us picture beige sand on a beach, but it actually comes in different colors. Tan, pink, white, and even black. The color depends on what kind of rock the sand came from. Tan sand is the most common, and it's made up of a rock called quartz that's been tinted by a chemical called iron oxide and another mineral called feldspar. Iron oxide is another form of what we call rust, which is why the sand gets that orangey, reddish tan tint. Pink sand beaches are a little bit more rare, but you can still find them in beautiful spots around the world, like Bermuda, the Bahamas, Greece, the Philippines, and Indonesia. The pink color comes from tiny single-celled critters called foraminifera that have red shells that tint the sand a pinkish color. These little organisms usually live in coral reefs, which is why pink sand tends to show up in tropical places. White sand beaches are also mostly made up of quartz, but the sand hasn't been tinted by iron oxide or feldspar. Black beaches are probably the rarest type and form near volcanoes. They're formed from eroding lava and basalt rocks that come from volcanic eruptions. Places like Iceland, Hawaii, and Japan are just a few places known for their volcanic black sand beaches. So next time you're at the beach, whether it's a picture-perfect paradise or an overcrowded strip of tan sand, take a minute to appreciate just how long it took for these mighty mountains to be turned into all our beautiful beaches. And even the less beautiful ones, too. Each and every year, tropical storms bear down on the coasts, bringing rain, wind, and waves in from the ocean. But unlike most natural disasters, these hurricanes all get their very own name. What's that about? Why do hurricanes get names? Let's find out on today's episode of Colossal Question. Every year around the end of the summer, Hurricane season starts in the U.S. when huge tropical storms start to pop up. These massive storms are rated on a scale from one to five, one being the weakest type of hurricane and five being the most severe and dangerous. But even a category one hurricane, the smallest kind, has winds between 74 and 95 miles per hour. Any storm that's category three, four, or five is considered a major hurricane that's likely to cause damage to buildings and the environment. Category five hurricanes happen whenever the wind is blowing at more than 157 miles per hour. That is very dangerously windy. Buildings, roofs, trees, and power poles are all at risk of being severely damaged when the wind is whipping around that fast. Part of what makes a hurricane so dangerous is that unlike other natural disasters like an earthquake or a tornado, a hurricane can last for a long time, sometimes longer than a week. That's because hurricanes are huge weather systems that move pretty slowly, only about 10 to 20 miles per hour. Creeping along slowly means the rain, waves, and wind all have plenty of time to damage whatever it's passing through. Hurricanes only develop over warm water that's 80 degrees Fahrenheit or above. When the warm, wet air over the tropical water rises, it's replaced by cooler air from above. That new cooler air will then start to warm up and rise, being replaced by new cool air again. When this cycle is repeated over and over again, huge storm clouds eventually start to form. These clouds start to spin with the rotation of the planet and get bigger, while wind speeds increase, only causing the cycle to happen faster and eventually forming a fully-fledged hurricane. 
Nowadays, hurricanes are each given their own individual name for one simple reason. It makes it much easier for meteorologists to track and identify each hurricane forming. Since there's often multiple hurricanes forming at any one time, sometimes in the same area of the ocean. Naming them simply makes things less confusing. Since 1979, the names have been picked by the World Meteorological Organization, who use six lists of male and female names to choose from. The lists have a name for each letter of the alphabet, except for Q, U, and Z. So, next time the power goes out and you're hunkered down safely during a storm, well, at least you know you can bust out this semi-useless fact to pass the time when you're bored.